Good evening. I'm reaching out to you not just as the village manager for the village or as a partner for the township, but I'm here as your neighbor, a parent, a leader amongst many, to extend my service and commitment to help us get through this together. I've been watching, of course, the television and all the reports on this growing concern about corona virus and so forth. And what are we doing here locally? As mayor of Yellow Springs, I had my ear to the ground. March 4th from the Ohio Municipal League, a special bulletin for our members. This week, the League participated in a conference call with the DeWine administration regarding the coronavirus and how local governments can engage with their local communities for preparedness and prevention. Well, that got my interest right there. And then I got a kick out of this next paragraph, rereading it later. It's important to note that according to the Federal Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the risk to the general public in most communities is currently considered low. There have been no confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Ohio. So this was March 4th. March 4th. So Wednesday, I'm hearing from the Ohio Municipal League. The weekend happens. Our village manager is doing the responsible thing and formulates an email to all staff, police department, and elected officials from the village manager. Our response, yesterday, Governor Mike DeWine issued executive order 2020-01D declaring a state of emergency. Now, this was on Monday, March 9th. What appeared in the Yellow Springs News that week was, again, a little brochure, two-sided page on health and safety dealing with the coronavirus. We, we weren't really kicking around COVID-19 yet, as a term, the coronavirus. From the community perspective, we've had, we've had we're, I feel fortunate that we have so many social service organizations, nonprofit organizations, that their mission and vision is to improve the quality of life for our residents. So having such a foundation in our community um, already in place uh, and that we can call upon to come together and, f and solve solution, the challenges that our community is facing, uh, that was beneficial and advantageous to us for a rapid response. I think one of the benefits of, um, you know, our amazing community, um, a liberal-minded community, is caring for one another and the immediacy of that. We've had a lot of folks um, locally step up, many people that we didn't even know, come forward and ask how we would be able to um, utilize things that they've offered and uh, the groups that have formed. I mean, we've had, I think, since day one, uh, Monday through Friday, our community outreach specialist, the village manager, community foundation and groups are meeting uh, once a day on Zoom. We, we started out with several town halls a week. Um, we still have those Wednesdays, every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Um, we'll have community leaders, the village manager, myself, fire chief, uh, council president, Brian Hausch, um, addressing uh, concerns, questions that the public has and, and putting out new information that we've received. My credit always goes to, first of all, the Yellow Springs Community Foundation and the good folks there for getting the, the behind the scenes ultimately and then out front the action to get organized as a village. I think I, I would say I'm both impressed on one hand but not surprised by how Yellow Springs and the township came together uh, to, to get through this pandemic. You know, this is a really difficult time for people, and it's gotten easier here in Ohio as, as we've relaxed things. Um, but those, you know, the first month and a half, I guess, month and a half or so of the lockdown was certainly difficult and odd to look downtown and not see anybody. Um, but it was amazing to see how quickly, um, 
I guess the group of community leaders came together. Like, boom, from that Friday the 13th meeting, people broke up into committees and started doing all sorts of wonderful organizing as, as good leaders do. I recall the day the, we called a meeting. It's a, we had a meeting at 7 a.m. on March 13th where we called community leaders and said, we've got to take action. We've got to put in the safety nets. We've got to create a robust communication network to get at every neighbor and our a resident in our community. Since uh, Friday, uh, the, a lot of groups in town um, have been meeting daily. Um, so this includes village departments, uh, Miami uh, Township Fire and Rescue, the Community Foundation, a lot of other nonprofits, and, and you'll be hearing more from them as, as we go, the schools, the senior center. And so I, I'm really excited about the fact that we're being as proactive as we can be in an evolving situation um, and that responses are careful and thoughtful as opposed to being overreactive. From the government side, we'll continue all essential services, that's public safety, uh, water, electricity, and all the other municipal services that you rely on. Those will continue. We have contingency plans to continue to deliver those services should we be required to operate with 50% or less of our staff. Uh, so we want to reassure the public on that. Um, President Council Brian House, House uh, stated earlier that we would not uh, be pursuing or issuing disconnect orders that will remain in effect. We would not disconnect your water, your electricity, or any other service you rely from us. I want to um, express to you that the police department is acting as business as usual. Um, we are at full staff. We have taken some precautionary measures for the officers. Um, please have some patience with us. All calls for service will be addressed as always. We may have an order to them now. Dispatchers um, may ask more questions than usual. I ask for our community, the, the citizens, to work together, stay strong, um, check on your neighbors, your neighbor's children. Um, contact the police department should you have any needs. It's business as usual for us. Uh, we are a strong community, and I believe that we will, uh, we will come through this. Thank you very much. Fire department is still there. We're still ready to come and help you out. Uh, we're taking some steps just to protect our staff because uh, we need to make sure they're healthy and they can come to work every day. So we are, uh, we've implemented today a no visitor policy at the fire station to uh, help keep, keep things out or keep things in. Um, our staff is all trained and ready to respond to calls should they come up related to this uh, pandemic. Um, we've got regional protocols in place. We're working with other county fire departments to make sure that ambulance service and other fire services are not interrupted whatsoever. Um, so our crews are ready should anyone need them. So uh, give us a call and we'll come help you out. It's a weird time and stressful. Uh, it's really stressful when you don't know the end point, uh, when this is when we're going to get back to normal. So, um, so we're, we're, we're getting that feedback and we want to do what we can to, to help folks and, and um, reduce some of those stresses. We have um, several areas of focus that we're working on. One is around food security, delivery, um, supporting the restaurants, and uh, this includes the schools, the seniors, the food pantries, the faith organizations, uh, as well as um, the restaurants. So there are efforts underway for food security the second is around local economic support. Um, so this is for businesses and residents around uh, getting unemployment benefits started, taking care of um, the utility costs where we can, uh, looking at deferred rent uh, with, with the cooperation and, and agreement of landlords, and, and keeping track of what businesses and, and restaurants are open and closed and communicating that. The third area is around financial assistance and the foundation it has set up a fund and we are working on uh, how you apply and then also working on um, donations and matching funds and that sort of thing as we, uh, as we look to the next several weeks of, of needs. Fourth area is childcare and youth services 
And so this is um, more of a self-organizing thing happening, already happening on the uh, Facebook bulletin board. Um, and there will be an additional neighborhood outreach um, process to, to find out what the needs are and how we can match those with volunteers. Which leads me into the fifth area, which is volunteer matchup. So again, we're looking for um, uh, f where the needs are and then people who have offered to provide help for those needs. The six areas in around communications. So this town hall is, is the start of that um, for serving Yellow Springs and Miami Township with information at least three times a week at the same time every day. I also want to just end by, by thanking uh, the team, the teams that have been working countless hours to, to figure out what we can do and how we can help. Um, a lot of people are working behind the scenes. A lot of folks from the village worked through the weekend to, to work on many of these, these plans. Um, so it's been very collaborative, um, which has been just wonderful. Um, and it's all because we're, we're all focused on the health and safety of everyone who lives here, works here, and plays here. Thank you. What continued to come then was the organization of our businesses, food, health concerns, financial. These are all businesses dealing with health and financial and restaurants and food and family care and transportation and safety, local business, and how can you help? Many, many documents like this were going around, including the creation of the NBC program neighborhood block contacts. I have two announcements to make. And the first involves contacts that are going to be made to everyone in the village and the township. This is an effort that was being started by the community foundation with a group of volunteers. Everyone will get a copy of that survey from their neighborhood Block Contact or NBC. In the village itself, we have 31 neighborhoods and this weekend is the official kickoff. The project I'm gonna talk about with you right now, we are calling the Neighborhood Block Contacts. Based upon the neighborhood block parties that we have every summer, what we did was we started with a list of about seven block party captains, folks who congregate for block parties and get those organized. And to a person, everyone agreed to be a contact person. We then added various volunteers uh, and names to the list. I blew up a map of Yellow Springs, figuratively speaking, blew up Yellow Springs here and divided it up into different sections three, four streets, perhaps one street if it was a large street, and began matching names of volunteers and putting them on the map. And these folks came, became in charge of a little zone mapped out in the village, and they leafleted. I know most people took leaflets around to the door or knocked on the door, or some through the, the summer block parties that they have, and that's where the name came from, Neighborhood Block Context, some of these folks already had established email lists, and so they contacted people and said, hey, what are your needs? Do you have any? Have you seen our need survey? Please take it. Let me know if you need anything. Here are some of the things that people were concerned about. Do people need help with grocery shopping, paying for food, refilling prescription meds, transportation to the doctor's office, someone to talk to, counseling, other medical needs, paying for housing, paying for utilities, other financial concerns, any transportation needs, safety needs, child care needs, elder care, maybe just a regular phone call to check in. Do you have any questions or do you have no needs at all? Are you okay for now? So this was disseminated Several hundred, I can't tell you how many, but several hundred responses came back in and needs were shuttled into red, basically red, orange, yellow, green. This person needs immediate help. These folks have no issues and so forth. So the village is now organized in those areas. 
So what I want to say is, from Friday, March 13th, continuing onward, this village has been organized. And by the way, the village leadership team was meeting, Zoom meetings, daily. As I think back, even weekends, we were meeting daily. It's, uh, you know, made it go from a full-time job to uh, <laughs> all hours of the day of, you know, every day of the week kind of job. Um, and we really are in rapid response mode. And so I think one thing that's been very different is, you know, people always complain about government, you know, taking a long time to make decisions and make anything happen. And we've been really pushing the button on that. So we have, you know, been as much as possible responding in an emergency mode, but at the same time, making sure that our decisions are well thought out, that are based on the facts and based on the science. Um, but that, that's been pretty wild. And uh, I know that for all of council, for all of our village team members, it's been pretty intense and it's, and it's you know, really, uh, it takes a toll physically, emotionally, you know, the whole bit. For me and for other administrators, city, manage, uh, city administrators, managers, village administrators, village managers, um, the difference is, is that this is a, a very unique challenge. So we all have our own playbooks. We know what works for certain situations and um, we know what we need to do to get a, a specific outcome. Well, with the, with the coronavirus, none of the, the plays in our playbook were applicable uh, because it was just so different. Um, so we were doing um, welfare checks. Uh, it started out daily with some of our single senior residents um, and anyone that people would call and ask us to check on. And that's continued, but we're looking more at like once a week now. Um, people are settling in. Um, we have a, a large population of folks with mental illness, and this has just exacerbated uh, many of the, the issues and things that they experience, uh, the pandemic. And so um, we're reaching and trying to stay in daily contact with those folks as well. I think another thing that's been very different is figuring out how to effectively navigate the virtual platforms. And, um, you know, being a village that's so hands-on with citizens, community members that are so engaged, that um, being there, you know, in real time and live is, is really, you know, just been something that we have gotten so used to and it makes such a big difference in terms of discussions and effective decision making. We realized early on that we couldn't just wait because there were so many things that we needed to decide. Um, and I think we've done a great job of making sure to provide a lot of access to citizens and to residents. So it's been really, uh, 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 I think, one of our success stories. We've been able to figure out um, how to navigate the virtual meetings well. This is Resolution 202011, authorizing the use of technology for holding official meetings of council while under a state of emergency. Whereas the governor of the state of Ohio has declared a state of emergency in response to the COVID-19 situation, and whereas council understands that there are essential functions of government which will need to continue, and whereas Sunshine Law prohibits meetings to be held through the use of technology and require in-person participation by officials, now therefore be it resolved by the council for the village of Yellow Springs, Green County, Ohio, that section one, in an effort to protect the public health, safety, and welfare of all citizens, including council members, citizens, and staff, if necessary, council does hereby authorize the use of technology to hold essential meetings. And encourage folks to practice physical distancing and other protective measures like wearing masks. So uh, um, two things we, I have we're tonight. We're making a concerted uh, the effort first to is that, uh, make this the, uh, uh, Yellow Springs make Chamber Board not just trendy, um, but under their just after the recommendation of the Yellow Springs Chamber Board. I want to remind you that the Yellow Springs Chamber Board is a member of the Yellow Springs Chamber Board. I want to speak about the support of the Yellow Springs Chamber Board. 
just uh, let you guys know, we are continuing in operations. We are uh, half staff uh, every other day. We are doing uh, 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 we are working on the immediate need while also preparing for the long-term work ahead of us. Thus, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Again, this is a marathon, not a sprint. I like the model. I, I was an early adopter of it. Um, I didn't come up with it. I don't recall who came up with it, but we all jumped on board with that model. And why we all could get around it, I think, is because many of us were science-based people, that we could see the science for what it was, and we knew that it was what we were facing was terrible. You know, we're looking here, we tell our guys, um, and this is what, you know, Josue and Chief Carlson and I have, have all spoken about, um, this is going to go on until there's a vaccine, and even beyond that, because... You know, you think about the logistics of rolling out a vaccine to 320 million people in a country. That's not a quick overnight process. So this is going to be a long-term problem. And I've heard health experts talk about 2022 before things get back to any semblance of normal. You know, so, so yeah, Josue is right. This is an ultra marathon, unfortunately, um, and not just a sprint. Yellow Springs being a very open-minded, liberal community recognize that we can't deny what the experts are telling us. Now, we also, you know, we're not going to just make decisions without um, thinking them through, being intentional, and making sure that what we were doing was actually going to work or make a difference. But that being said, you know, we were listening to public health and following what Greene County Public Health was saying. We were listening to uh, the State Department of Health and the governor and following those recommendations. Um, and we were also, as I mentioned, listening to our community members um, who you know, were giving us a lot of feedback, sharing a lot of information. You know, I think we're, we're fortunate here that, that our, our you know, community leaders from government to uh, you know, foundation support and um, NGOs, but that's not the, for the local term, but you know, the, the community groups, um, everyone's grounded by science. I mean, we all paid attention and listened to the science side and fortunately didn't give in to the hysteria um, and the, uh, you know, to use the term fake news. We knew early on that we would be in this for the long haul and we needed to be prepared to have a response that we can all sustain. And I think that was the key part of that message, be prepared for the marathon, is do all that you can, but in a way that is sustainable on the long term. If we all just jumped and did things to solve something in one week, well, we didn't want to burn people out. We knew we needed to put in a, a structure in a place that could support, say, delivering food to all of our residents, not just for a week or two weeks, but an extended period of time. The village and township is in good shape thanks to the proactive collaboration of an extensive local network of organizations and individuals who have been meeting daily since March 12 to develop careful and thoughtful responses to prioritize community needs given the impacts of coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. The coalition of nonprofits, government agencies, elected officials, and representatives of key stakeholder groups is identifying gaps in services, and coordinating services to help us get through this pandemic together. We're in August and we're still supporting families um, from the school system. So that's the, the marathon piece. We know that the food scarcity is an issue and food insecurity, and we have to put in the systems in place to be able to sustain that. We have needed to become not only nimble, but flexible in our decision-making. So something that makes sense one day Two days later may not make much sense at all. And I think that's just an aspect of, you know, all the changes that are constantly happening, the lack of information. And um, it, I think it's getting better, but, you know, we have needed to get used to saying, okay, we did our best based on what we knew then. 
and we've, uh, we're changing direction because of everything we've learned subsequently. You know, initially, um, you know, studies were showing only masks like an N95 would make any difference. Um, and then surgical masks were said, oh wait, this does make a difference. And now cloth masks, but not all cloth masks. You know, and this evolves, and I know people get upset, and you see people on social media who say, well, how can a mask work if this one doesn't work? And this is all new territory. So, I mean, we just kind of thought about the best practices in infection control, um, but it made sense. It made sense. You know, that first step of saying that we expect people to wear masks downtown was really important, just because it's not easy to distance. Um, and while we have hand sanitizing stations, that's not enough. So then, you know, seeing that we were getting some compliance, but not the compliance that we wanted, we stepped it up by uh, passing an ordinance that had civil penalties, uh, and it's starting with warnings, uh, putting people in mayor's court, potentially having community service if that was, you know, uh, something that would basically take it away from not being so um, criminal and punitive in nature but would still get um, the behavior that we expected to keep our community safe and to keep our visitors safe. Residents, individuals throughout the country, throughout the state, had a very different response on the basic protective measures. I was particularly taken aback on the pushback from individuals on mask wearing. Uh, for me, it just seems such a, such a very basic protective measure that all of us could take and to have such a negative response uh, uh, about it was, uh, um, was unique and I was taken aback by it, I was surprised. One of the things that really helped was that um, Dayton uh, and some other uh, uh, jurisdictions that uh, are nearby did uh, subsequently also pass mask requirements so people started to get more used to it. It was even more helpful when the governor finally decided to pass a statewide mandate to wear face coverings. But in between that, uh, because we were not in the red zone uh, in Greene County, our public health department was not, rec or was not requiring face coverings. The governor had not yet done that. And we were trying to figure out how do we actually enforce a law which is very difficult to enforce um, as all the other communities that have passed mass requirements have discovered. It is a, a complex thing to navigate as a peace officer. Um, you know, many people feel that it's an infraction on rights. Um, we, we've kind of approached it in the same way we do everything regarding public safety, and that is to uh, attempt to mediate uh, remedy the situation in the moment and um, educate and then also provide service uh, if possible or, or if uh, folks need it in that interaction. Um, where we come into difficulty is when um, once a resolution, an ordinance is passed, um, you know, creating the potential of a citation for wearing a mask, we're in that kind of gray area because um, we, we don't want to be the, the most punitive arm of uh, law enforcement. That's something that we practice in every avenue. However, this reaches uh, safety proportions very similar to, say, you know, uh, someone driving under the influence or, you know, the potential for harm because of this is great. So we've been doing very well. We have not issued any citations specifically related uh, to not wearing a mask or distancing. We've given out thousands of masks. Um, our village council put together an ambassador program where on the weekends they were handing out masks. I believe thousands of those were given out as well. And the response has been phenomenal. So one of the strategies we had besides, um, you know, lots of signage, uh, providing a lot of messaging about why face coverings were important was the mask ambassador initiative. 
We were hesitant at first about whether this would lead to um, you know, arguments on the sidewalk, people escalating and whatnot. But what we found over the five weekends that we did it was that people were very open to being offered a mask. A lot of times people forgot their mask or surprisingly didn't even realize they were supposed to wear one or didn't understand you know, why it was important for public safety. So ultimately, most people when offered a mask took it, put it on, it was great. A lot of people were wearing masks already and sometimes they would upgrade their mask. And so part of that initiative was to buy masks from local businesses uh, with the support of the chamber and the community foundation and the village. And we were taking donations to keep the program going. So those that were upgrading their masks were also supporting our local businesses while keeping everyone safe. And so very quickly what we saw was that you know, we went from like maybe 75% compliance to 95% plus compliance. Just about everybody was wearing a mask, whether they were in town, from town or out of town. And um, I mean, it was just for me to see such great behavior and to also hear all the stories of people from Cincinnati, Columbus, Dayton, saying that they came to Yellow Springs because they knew they would feel safe. That was really encouraging. If we were gonna require people to wear masks, we needed to be proactive about making sure that they had those masks. And it, it worked so well, we felt that after five weeks, our job was done there. And you know, more and more, some of those groups that weren't wearing masks, that honestly were local, as opposed to from out of town, have started to realize the importance. And um, we're seeing great behavior still, and I think most people are feeling quite safe. As we learned more and we saw what our community needed, we realized that there were some areas where we needed to depart from some of their recommendations, be a little bit more uh, active to protect our community. And uh, I think some of those things uh, were really important moves, you know, including being the first municipality in Ohio to require masks, uh, some of the other things that we did around, you know, just keeping up with communications, town halls and so forth. And, and all of that has really worked together to uh, keep this consistent and effective strategy going. Um, that's, you know, meant that, you know, basically people do feel safe, whether they live here or they visit here. And um, the proof is in the pudding in terms of the fact that we're not seeing the high infection rates or the deaths that other places are seeing. I also wanna thank our wonderful community leaders who are doing a great job of making sure that we are building a resilient, robust safety net that no one falls through the cracks. With that, I wanna wish you a good night, stay safe.